Welcome back to our study of the Gospel of John here on Growing in the Gospel. I'm Pastor Kerry, and we are starting today part 19 of our study, verse by verse through the Gospel of John. Today, we're in John chapter 6, but we're towards the end of the chapter. The title of the message is Safe Jesus, Learning How to Rest in a Sovereign Savior. God really used this particular story in my life during the storm of cancer. I don't know what storm you're going through right now, but if you're going through a storm, or if you know someone who is, today's message will encourage and strengthen you or that person. Let's press into John chapter 6, and let's discover safe Jesus. Journey with us verse by verse through John's Gospel. When I get uh, periodically the privilege to teach a marriage event, like a retreat or something, I like to say to younger husbands, I learned where the landmines are by stepping on them. Um, and one of those events happened really early in our marriage. We were married probably two and a half, three years. Lance was, I think, less than a year old. Um, we only had one child. And even early on, we made a priority of, of taking breaks and days off. And we wanted to establish you know, the, the practice of getting away and going and enjoying and playing together as a family. And, and so we, I had this brainy idea, we're going to get in the car and drive up to Lake Isabella, which is in Southern California at the base of uh, the Sierra Nevadas. Um, in the woods, in the mountains, it's a beautiful lake, beautiful area. We're just going to spend the day up there. And, and we did. We saw a lot of things and ate some good food and enjoyed the scenery of the, of the mountains and the topography. And as we were going around the lake, I saw a little marina down um, kind of in the valley. The lake is surrounded by hills, so the road is up high above the lake. And I got this um, husband idea. You know what, what those are, right? It was just, you know, it's a bad idea, but I think it's a good one. Hey, let's go see if they rent boats. Dan says, let's not. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, this will be good. She's like, no, no, we have, a, we have a child that's under a year old. Let's not. But I'm looking at the lake, and it's calm, and it's like, yeah, come on, we can do this. So I, I was driving, so I drove the car and um, went down to the marina, got out, and Dana finally acquiesced against her um, wisdom and uh, good sense. I kept saying, trust me, it's going to be fine. Trust me. Trust me. Did I know anything about boats? No. But I kept saying, trust me. You know, we'll have a good time. Lance is never going to remember this, okay? Um, but I'm, in my mind, you know, we've got to create good memories. So anyway, we get the boat. For about 60 bucks, it's a little tiny speedboat, four seats. We get in that boat. We start to putter out of the marina for an hour, okay? We got this boat for an hour. We get about 30 minutes away from the dock, from the marina, which means we're 30 minutes back. And all of a sudden, everything changed. This calm, pristine lake nestled in these peaceful mountains, became a torrent. I mean, all of a sudden, wind. Wind like we could never have predicted or expected, and suddenly the water began to stir and whip up, and suddenly there's literally white caps on this lake, and we are bouncing around in this little boat. And I'm trying to pretend like I'm having fun, but I'm scared out of my mind. <laughs> and Dana has wrapped Lance in... in um, life vests. I mean, he's got this little baby head, and he's just this big blob of orange life vests. I had no life vest left because it's wrapped around Lance, so I surely would have died. And the look, Dana looked at me, and I, here's what I thought. If we die now, I won't die when I get to the dock, because I'm pretty sure she's going to kill me. I'm pretty sure she's going to kill me. But I kept going, it's okay, it's okay. We're, and water's splashing in, and we're bouncing around and getting sick, and I'm puttering back to the marina. Oh, I've never been so happy as when we pulled that boat into that marina and we got out of there. And she was, let's just say she was pretty quiet on the drive home. Um, but that day I survived. But I did learn how quickly things can go from peaceful and pristine and predictable and just everything's good to suddenly everything's coming undone. Now, we've all felt that in the last few years, probably at a deeper level than we even give ourselves permission to think and realize. We've all felt this, everything's good, everything's, everything's kind of going along pretty well, and then boom, storms descend, 
and all of a sudden the waves are boisterous. And today we're going to talk about a storm. The story in John turns towards a profound little piece that to me has been life-changing. I feel like this is sacred ground because all week I've been praying for you and your storm and I've been uh, anticipating, trying to my best to get out of the way of Jesus and let him speak into your storm. And the reason I say it's sacred ground is that I don't know what your storm is and most in the room may not, but a lot of people came in here with a storm brewing and raging in your life. Some are coming out of a storm, some are coming into a storm, some are right in the middle of a storm. And I say it's sacred ground, I think by the time we're done, maybe you'll feel the same. How do we rest in storms? How do we as followers of Jesus even categorize the storms of life? What are they? How do we frame expectations and understanding and perspective? And how do we navigate those storms? And is it even possible to have joy in the storms? Here's the key I want to put before you today that we're going to unfold, and that is Jesus is Lord of the storms, and he's doing something marvelous in the middle of my storm. Now, I want you to read that with me, and it may be hard to read. You may not even believe it right now. So say it out loud with me if you can read that with me. Ready, go. Jesus is Lord of the storm, and he's doing something marvelous in the middle of my storm. So I want you to open to John 6. We're going to pick it up in verse 15. And in your outline, I want you to write down the first observation and that is simply this, that spiritual solitude gives us clarity and perspective. Spiritual solitude gives us clarity and perspective. This is the pre-storm discipline, the pre-storm walk with Jesus and relationship that we're cultivating and growing with Jesus. And we're going to see how Jesus practiced solitude with his heavenly Father in his earthly life. Verse 15 picks up the story from last week. Remember the story. He's taken a boat across the sea to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. 25,000 people have followed him there, gathered on a hillside where all day he ministered and taught. Then they ran out. They didn't have any food, and the people were hungry. He sat them down. The little boy with the loaves and the fishes was found, and Jesus uh, materialized food for 25,000 people. He performed a massive miracle of feeding and satisfying hunger. So the response to this miracle is profound. Look at verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived, he's pretty perceptive being God, when he perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now, this whole story in the early part of chapter six began with Jesus trying to get into solitude alone with his heavenly Father and maybe with his disciples to rest, to pray, uh, to recalibrate and renew a little bit. A lot of depletion, a lot of expenditure, and Jesus himself as God, the God-man, needed to get away and rest and replenish, as you do too and I do too. But uh, it didn't happen. He ended up serving all day and expending himself yet another day. So finally, at the end of the day, he perceives that the people, they, the people, would come and take him by force. This man can materialize food. In the first century, your whole life was about growing and getting food and having enough food, your next meal. And Jesus can manufacture it. Hey, we want him to be king now. That's what the people thought. Who wouldn't? And so they immediately begin to exert power over Jesus. They're going to force him. They're going to physically take him and force him to be king so that they can use him and exploit him for their political purposes. Sounds like 2022. When you ever hear the Christian gospel Jesus narrative married to temporal political movements, understand, the same thing that happened in Jesus' life. And Jesus said, hey, I, I mean, essentially, here, here's the reality. He is king. He's king now. He's king forever, and he will be king, and everybody will bow before him. But he's not here to serve our political short-term purposes. He's got a big kingdom and a long story. And so 
the message to the crowd is, you do not control me. Really, the message of the whole story of the storm we're going to see is, nobody controls me, I control everything. And you can never reduce Jesus to merely be a manipulating, a a power that you manipulate for your short-term, short-sighted ends. But we all go there. We all do. We all want Jesus to do what we want him to do instead of seeking a relationship in which we discover what he's doing and we cooperate with him in it. And so Jesus is going to take us on a journey with his disciples in this moment. But the first thing he does is that he goes alone into the mountain to pray. I just want to footnote this and move on to the second observation. This was Jesus' regular practice, solitude with his heavenly Father. He goes to God to clear his head. He needs to commune with God. This is what you need. This is what I need. And we need this not only in urgent crises, we need this every day and every week of our lives. And as Jesus built a practice, in fact, I put more verses in your outline to show this was a recurring thing for him to go into the mountain to pray, to take Peter, James, and John to pray, his disciples, sometimes alone, sometimes late, sometimes early, in the morning, rising up a great while before day. He goes to a solitary place, solitude, to pray. Psalm 55, David wrote, evening, morning, and noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. My friends, if you want to navigate 2022, the storms of this light world and the storms of your life, you need a practice of solitude with God. You must build at all costs, okay? This is more valuable than overtime and ex- overextension and overwork and all the things that run you on the hamster wheel of life. You must create, you must fight for and protect a life schedule that allows for solitude with your heavenly Father, that allows you to get clarity in his word, and that prepares you for the storms you have yet to face in your life. This was Jesus' practice. This should be ours. But I want you to see the second observation, and that is this, that stormy seasons induce fear and perplexity. Stormy seasons bring us, they, they, they force upon us the human instinctive response is fear. It's panic, it's perplexity, it's confusion, and the story unfolds in verse 16. So follow along with me. And I want to read just a a few verses, and then we'll unpack the story and shine some more light on it. And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. So they're going towards the west, back toward their home base of Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blue. So the Sea of Galilee is several hundred feet below sea level. It's steep uh, cliff-like hills all around the sea. The northern is a little more of a slope, but all around the east-west and, and the southern is more of a slope com- coming out of the valley. But it's, it's, it's surrounded by tall mountains. And in that region of the world, just like Lake Isabel in California, the wind can whip up from the Mediterranean over the hills, through the canyons and, and, and passes, and it And it it, the the, the force, the science behind it, it creates forceful winds that come sweeping down into that lake completely without notice. We were there a few years ago, um, and it was my first time there. We were at Capernaum. I kind of broke away from the group, and I found myself my way down to the water's edge. It's very stony and rocky down there, and I just began. I was processing the fact that I'm standing where Jesus called his disciples. I'm standing in this place where he home base, and it was just surreal. We'll be there in uh, November with a, a large group from our church. We're excited about that. But while I'm standing there, we went from calm seas and sunny skies to wind, forceful wind that started blowing so hard, they closed things down and made us get back on the bus. But the, the waves in a moment whipped up on that sea with white caps, and I began to imagine, oh, this is it. This is what happened with Jesus and the disciples. So the storm, the, uh, the, the disciples on the boat, Jesus in the mountain with his heavenly Father. Now, there's a lot of amazing aspects to this that I want to unfold for a minute. We don't really associate following Jesus with storms. We usually disassociate those things. We usually think this, yeah, storms are, you know, I've got Jesus, and so Jesus kind of, he takes care of all my storms, and I'll never see a storm, I'll never go into a storm, uh, because I've got Jesus. No, Jesus 
The Bible says in Matthew and Mark, there's two other disciples that, or two other gospels that give an account, this account. Matthew and Mark both say that he constrained them. Jesus constrained them. He sent the people away, and then he commanded his disciples to go get in the boat and go across the sea. He knows the storm is coming. And he sends his disciples into the storm. I want you to process this about your storm for a moment. I've been through storms, and the first thing I think is, God, get me out of this. God, take this away. Or what did I do to deserve this? Very rarely is the first thought, oh, God sent me into a storm. But that is the reality. God used this story in my life very profoundly in one of my storms. And in the middle of the storm, I want to mope and, and, and self-pity and complain and kind of gripe and go sour. And God used this story to say, hey, I, Carrie, I sent you into this. Uh, it surprises you, but it does not surprise him. And I don't know about you, but if you will let that reality sink in for a moment, God brought me into this. It changes the nature of what this is. It changes the whole concept of what a storm is if you know your Savior sent you into it. That changes the, that gives purpose, it gives promise, it gives hope, it gives strength. The whole light, it gives an assignment. It, it all, all of a sudden, the storm is not a surprise, it's an assignment. It's an opportunity to experience and see God at work and learn something I'm never going to learn in any other way. Somebody said this, God speaks to us through the regularity with which he interrupts our plans. Now be honest with me, does God ever interrupt your plans? Like all the time? Some of you are like, I never realized he spoke to me so much. <laughs> our disruptions are him breaking in. They're him breaking in to time and space and saying, hey, I am the author and the finisher. I'm the shepherd. You're mine. You belong to me. And all of this is mine. Matthew describes this account this way. The ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. The disciples are terrified. I want you to create this picture in your mind and go there with me. It's the middle of the night. It's pitch black. There's clouds. There's no natural light. There's no electricity, okay? And so they are in a small boat in total chaos, in total darkness, completely disoriented. They just left this mountaintop massive miracle, and now they're in the polar opposite place of the jaws of despair and death, and they're frantic. Now, verse 25 in Matthew 14 says, in the fourth watch of the night. And I want you to put together the timeline for a moment. Jesus sent the crowd away when even was come, and he sent the disciples away when even was come. So the, the night, uh, the time for Hebrews had four watches in the night. The first watch was 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second watch was 9 to 12. The third watch was 12 to 3. And the fourth watch was 3 to 6 a.m. So do some math with me. The disciples are on the Sea of Galilee, lost in a storm, near-death experience. It's complete chaos. And they're rowing frantically and trying to find land, but they can't see even which way they're facing, okay? They're rowing frantically. Some, this, this journey started somewhere around 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock. And they're rowing through the night until maybe 4 or 5 a.m. So it's safe to say for eight solid hours, these guys are working their brains out to stay alive. They're not only terrified, they're exhausted. Row, anybody, well, don't raise your hand, but ever done rowing for an exercise? I mean, I could hack 30, 45 minutes of that. Tops? Eight hours? What kind of frazzled despair and frustration? And they've got to be reaching the end of their human strength. Eight hours of despair. Here's the crazy thing about this. 
John, in verse 19, says they had gone 25 or 30 furlongs. A furlong is 220 yards, one-eighth of a mile, which means they've gone about four miles. Now, do the math. You can walk three miles slowly in an hour. Eight hours, four miles? Is that half a mile an hour? Mathematicians, am I right? A mile every two hours. They're going nowhere, and they're trying hard to go nowhere. And all of their effort and all of their hard work and strength and their human reason is completely insufficient. They're getting nowhere. Fear, perplexity, but this is a storm that Jesus sent them into. So I want you to see my third observation. And this is where the story gets really cool. You ready? Talk to me. Are you ready? Help me out. Okay. It's lonely up here sometimes. Okay. Verse 19. So when they had rowed five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea. Now just pause for a minute and think about that. This word walking does not mean he was treading water or he was walking through water. The word walking, is, the sense of it is that he was strolling. He was out for a Sunday afternoon stroll. It's what you do when you're sightseeing. He's walking on the water. Like, these guys are, they just can't row hard enough to get anywhere. And Jesus is, what, is doing what you do on a cool September evening in Connecticut. You just take a nice stroll through the neighborhood or down the bike path on the Farmington River. You just stroll. You're just taking it in. And I want you to picture this. These guys are losing their minds with fear, and Jesus is <laughs> admiring the artistry. It's, have you ever looked at a painting of a storm and just admired the work of the artist? I get the feeling. That's kind of what Jesus is like, admiring his own handiwork. Wow, this is, but he's coming to them. That's important. He's coming to them in the storm. It's important to put this together in sequence. He did not calm the storm yet. He has not rescued them from the storm. He has not removed the storm. He's entered it. That's pretty cool. So Jesus doesn't just send us into the storm. He comes to us in our storms. He's in our storms with us. Now, when you read all three of the accounts, in two of the accounts, they see him and they, they don't think it's him. They don't know it's him, and they really freak out. All of a sudden, they're living in a Stephen King novel. First of all, it's a raging storm, and now the devil's coming for us out of that storm. They think there's a demon or a spirit in that storm coming to haunt them. You know, like, oh, now, if we didn't have horrible problems before, the the the, the Angel of death is now coming for us. And they panic. They don't recognize that it's Jesus, but it is. He comes to us in the storm, walking on the sea, the miraculous control of all the elements around them. And it says he's drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But then, look at John's account in verse 20. He says unto them, it is I, be not afraid. Okay. Hey, guys, it's, it's me. Don't be afraid. Now, I like Matthew and Mark's account of this. Here's what they say. I want to get it right. Be of good cheer. In his eye, be not afraid. Let me paraphrase it. Hey, cheer up, guys. It's me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> Look at this. Can you believe this? Jesus is living in a totally different headspace than these guys. He's operating on a completely different economy. This storm is no threat to him. It's artistry in motion. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a thing to behold. It's a thing to stroll through. And for them, it's a thing to destroy them. And so he says something humanly irrational. He gives them a directive that 
if you said this to your friend, you would be considered inconsiderate and thoughtless. Cheer up, man. Hey, cheer up. It, it, you'd almost be perceived as taking your friend's storm lightly or frivolously or trivializing their pain in some way. But I want you to ga- uh, grasp this and let the Spirit of God drive this into your heart and psyche. The Savior, the creator of the universe, comes to you in the storm and says, it's me. Cheer up. And I can testify from my storms, and I'm sure there are storms I will face yet ahead in my life, and there are for you as well. And I know you don't like to hear that, but, but you don't need to be afraid of the storms. Because I can't imagine a storm, I can't imagine any storm in which, uh, any storm that wouldn't be completely neutralized in its power and its threat and its emotional and psychological oppression after hearing Jesus say, it's me, cheer up, cheer up. Again, it seems irrational, it seems insensitive. But on his, through his perspective, he can fix the storm that fast. He knows where it's going. He knows what he's doing. He is demonstrating who he is to these men. He's not afraid. And he says to them, you can have cheer. Now listen, it takes some deliberation. It takes some intentionality. It takes a decision. Because you have to decide, am I going to go with the, the fear and the panic, or am I going to go with the cheer? Fear or cheer? Which one? And your human instinct, your natural response is going to be fear, panic, row harder. <laughs> and even believers, even Christians, the first response is, oh, good, Jesus, come on, get in the boat, help us row. <laughs> help us bail water. We need all the hands we can get. You know, we, we want to apply Jesus to our solutions. Like the missing ingredient that's making my plan, you know, really come together is Jesus. He comes into the plan with a storm and blows up the plan. He, he, he destroys the plan and leaves you completely disoriented in, in the storm and comes to you in the storm and says, I'm here, cheer up. And you have to make a decision. I'll be cheerful. And I, I, I feel insensitive to tell you that, but I know the Savior is, that's what he told me, cheer up. And here's what's interesting about that is when you actually do, by faith, decide to cheer up, people will think you've lost your mind. People expect you to mope and be miserable all the time in your storm. And so when you're actually cheerful, people are like, oh, he's in denial. She's in denial. She doesn't really understand the gravity of this. Gravity levity. The scales change when Jesus arrives. What is massively uh, grave to us, he, he, he makes light very quickly. So Jesus uh, sends me into the storm. He comes to me in the storm. That's, that's awesome. He tells me to do something that's Sounds to me pretty hard, but it must be possible because he says, cheer up. And the key to cheering up is this is him, okay? Oh, it's him. That means there's purpose. That means someday it's going to be over. That, okay, so he sends us into the storm. By the way, storms are seasonal. They're not continual. So whether you're in one, coming out of one, going into one, just know this. It's temporal. It's not going to last that long. You're going to be through it before you know it. It's going to be over very quickly. And God's going to bring you through. So he sends me in. He meets me there. He tells me to cheer up. Um, There's something interesting about this story that doesn't show up in John's account. And it's kind of funny. I've told you how John and Peter are competitive. You guys remember that? Uh, Some of you, I need to remind you. Uh, Easter Sunday, they ran to the tomb. And John specifically notes that he beat Peter to the tomb. And then he really, really delineates Peter's denial. 
of Jesus, what a loser he was. And then when Peter is being confronted by Jesus in John 21 on the shore of Galilee and told that he's gonna die a martyr's death, Peter looks at John and goes, well, what about him? Like, if I gotta die, he's gotta die too. You know, fair is fair. These guys are highly competitive. They are type A, headbutting individuals. Um, well, it shows up again here because this is the story where Peter walks on the water. But John completely leaves that out. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. He's writing, he's writing. You know, in his mind, he remembered, oh, that's when Peter walked on the water. Not gonna mention that. And then we went to the land. <laughs> it's hilarious. I imagine Peter reading John's account and going, oh, John, really? You left out? I mean, Matthew and Mark, keep it in. John leaves it out. I think that's hilarious. We don't need to talk about Peter. Peter has been redacted from John's history, <laughs> except for all the negative qualities of Peter. Unfortunately, we still do that kind of stuff today. So, Jesus comes walking. When he announces who it is, they, they see him. He says, be of good cheer. And Peter, Matthew records this, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, I want to come out there with you. And Jesus says, come on. I, admi I mean, I'm like just in awe of Peter's audacious, irrational courage. Like, if I got to be in this storm, I'd much rather be walking on the water with you than in this crazy little boat, which that's a cool thought. I'd rather be in the storm with Jesus than in a boat in a storm without Jesus. But here's what, it, this is what drove really deep to me in my storm was Jesus not only authored the storm, sent me into the storm, um, comes to me in the storm, tells me to cheer up in the storm before he calms it, before he changes the circumstances. When I say, uh, is that really you? Can I get out? There? Jesus says, come, into, come out here with me. I'm telling you, Years ago when I read that in the middle of a storm, I was just celebrating the fact that this was Jesus in a storm. But what the Spirit of God said to me in that moment is let go of your little boat and get into the storm. Like immerse yourself, embrace the storm. You see, even in the storms, we like to hold on to our solutions. We like to hold on to our sinking securities. We like to hold on to whatever little bit of, uh, of, of, of safety we feel we can conjure up but this is Peter's question and Jesus' invitation is this radical abandon. Just let go of all of your idea of security in that little boat and join me in the storm. Radical trust, radical abandon. Gulp. So pastor, you're telling me Jesus sent me into the storm. He's gonna meet me in the storm. And I love to hear that, pastor. You're telling me to cheer up in the storm. That's what Jesus says. That's a little hard to swallow, but now you're telling me to embrace the storm, to like enter it. Here's why. And this struck me deeply as well. As a younger Christian, I always looked at this as a storm that happened that then Jesus shows up and fixes. But in the middle of my storm, it had a very different view. No, this is Jesus at the helm of the storm. The storm is completely at his command. He's not fixing an accident, he's orchestrating an event. He's not fixing an accident in your life, he's orchestrating an event by his providence that has great mystery to it, eternal mystery. And when the storm lifts from eternity's vantage point, it's gonna blow your mind, the marvelous things he did with your storm, and what he taught you and what he's, how he's growing you in your storm. So Jesus doesn't just say, be of good cheer, I'm here with you. I mean, he's at the helm of the storm and he says, join me in the, the storm because I'm in total control. Last, next to last observation, we're almost done. Look at verse 21. So he says, uh, it is I, be not afraid. Then verse 21, then, brilliant decision, they willingly received him into the ship. Some of you have yet to receive Jesus 
into the ship of your life. You'd rather sail on your own sea. But maybe today you could invite him in as Savior. So they willingly receive him into the ship, and immediately, look at that word, immediately. Shout it out. Ready, go. Oh, come on. Immediately. Think about this. This is really cool. Immediately, the ship was at the land whither they went. So Jesus sends them into a storm for eight hours. They're rowing their brains out, working their brains out, trying hard to get to nowhere, and they never get there. Jesus shows up when he decides to show up, and he always knows when to show up. He shows up miraculously. He has a conversation in the storm, gets into the boat, and immediately, no work, no effort, they're at their destination. We want Jesus to help us do our work. We want Jesus to work with us. We got our rowing and we're going, come on, Jesus, help me out, help me out. I've only done four hours and four miles and eight hours, but with you, I'll probably do five. You know, and what Jesus says is, I don't need your rows, I don't need your arms, I don't need anything to get you where I want you to go. I don't need anything to give to make you as productive as I want to make you. I can think you to a destination that you've worked and worked and worked to get to. You see, Jesus trumps everything. He trumps your plans, he trumps your efforts, he trumps all of your intentions and all of your solutions and all of your ideas, and immediately, immediately, he can get you to your destination. He calls us into the storm, he controls the storm, he says, be of good cheer in the storm, He joins us, he invites us to join him, and he walks with us through the storm, and then he, at the right moment, calms it and gets us home. Now, I'm gonna wrap up quickly, but I want you to see some scriptures I put in your outline, and I want you to see why I put them there. Up to now, I've talked only about your personal storms. And my prayer for you is that these realities will anchor you deeply and that you'll experience Jesus in the storm, and that you'll be decisional about the cheer and the releasing and the accepting and the embracing. But I want to address just for a minute the storm of the world that we see unfolding around us every day. It's all around us. It's like the world is coming undone right now. It's like it's getting more insane and more insane and more insane. It's completely irrational. There is no truth And so loud voices are screaming whatever they want to be true. And it's scary. If you actually believe in truth and Jesus, it can be scary when you look at the nonsense and the undoing of the world, a world that's rejected God. And I want to say Jesus is sovereign over that storm like he's sovereign over yours. And he is your safe haven in the storm of the world. And I put Psalm 33 in your outline because God made the heavens. He commanded and it stood fast. And he brings the counsel of the heathen to naught and makes the devices of the people of none effect. God controls the storm. It looks to you and I like evil is gaining ground and taking over and oh my goodness, this is getting worse and worse. But God says, hey, I have put evil, wickedness, sin on a leash. And I'm going to bring it to naught. Isaiah 8. Isaiah was instructed to tell the people not to buy into conspiracies or confederacies is the word. And he says specifically, don't fear their fear. God followers, God believers, don't be afraid like they're afraid like the world is afraid. He, God, let him be your fear. He shall be a sanctuary. And then Isaiah a little later said, bind up the testimony, that's his word, among my disciples, that's you and me, and I will wait upon the Lord. I'll wait in the storm for him to show up. And I will look for him. So we're in a storm, big storm right now. I believe we're really near the end. 
In regards to embracing and understanding and resting in these storms, I like what Tim Keller said. He said, if you say to God, I'll serve you if, or I'll believe in you as long as, what's on the other side of the if? That's your real God. Because that's serving God conditionally. Lord, I'll go with you as long as this happens. The condition, that's your real God. That's your idol. And Jesus, God, is just a means to get to an end. It's exactly what they wanted in verse 15. We want to make you president. Jesus said, no. If you follow me, you follow me into storms. If you follow me, I'm in control. I'm the author. I'm the God of the universe. And God promises us, 2 Thessalonians, he is withholding, he is restraining evil. He who now lets will let. That word let is restrain. He's holding back the forces of evil, even though we, it's hard for us to see that, okay? And then he says in Revelation 22, behold, I come, say it out loud, church, quickly. You see, the same Jesus that immediately took a boat to land can in a twinkle of an eye get you home. No more storms forever. The same Jesus can get you to the de destination you're working so hard to get to, he can get you there. And until then, Peter says, the same Peter that walked on the water said, the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober, serious, and watch unto prayer. So for believers, I invite you today. No one said you had to like the storm, okay? But embrace it, be of good cheer in it, trust God in it, meet him there. And then let me speak to you if you're not yet a believer. If you haven't yet invited Jesus into the boat. John 6, they willingly received him. Matthew 14, when Peter walked on the water, he began to sink, and some of you remember this, he cried, Lord, save me. And that's a prayer that Jesus always answers. You see, your biggest storm is not a job loss, a financial distress, a health trial. Those are not your biggest storms. It's not a car accident or the loss of a loved one. Those are big storms. I, it, from our vantage point, those are big. You know what your biggest storm is? Alienation from God, sin, condemnation. And Jesus came to you and me in that storm. He bottled up that storm and went to a cross where God poured it out on him. All the judgment, all the condemnation that I deserve for the life I've lived, all of the uh, anger and wrath for my sin that I deserve, God put on Jesus. Jesus went through my greatest storm so that he could save me from it, so I never would have to see it. First Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, Jesus was perfect, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus on the cross bears your sin so that God can look at you and me as forgiven. How does that happen? The moment you say, Jesus, save me. The moment you place, truly place your faith in him. He is safe. Only he is safe. And that's why we call him Savior. Hey, Jesus is safe. He is safe. In fact, he's the only safety, true safety for our souls. If you've never received him, then run to him right now. Run into his arms. Fall before him. Bow before him. Lift up your heart. Cry out to him and ask him to be your savior. And he will. He wants to be. He will come into your life and save you. And if you have made that decision, then I just encourage you today, whatever storm you're facing, rest in him. Let him give you rest that he is at work and he knows how to bring you safely home. Thanks for joining me for part 19 of the Gospel of John. We'll see you in part 20.